Thank you. Uh, Lars called me yesterday morning and asked if I could step in. And the first thing he told me was, uh, don't give too much statistics. And I thought, well, well I'm a statistician. So I'm going to try and uh, make this as less statistical as possible. Uh, my area of expertise, of course, is statistics. So um, I got interested in single case designs because my uh, colleague Smita once had a paper uh, reviewed by um, a couple of experts who came back and said, how do you really show causality in this uh, data? And she came to me with this data set and she said, how do you show causality? She had uh, three children who were tracked across time. And how would you analyze this statistically? And the idea of big data is so huge now. Everywhere you hear big data, big data, big data. So I wanted to just be a renegade and I thought, let me think small data. So that's how I got into single case designs. Um, it's especially, um, it especially aligns with my area of expertise, which is Bayesian statistics, which works well with, single, uh, with small sample cases. So messy data, Bayesian statistics is good for that. Um, I will cover a, a very little uh, portion of that today. So the background to single case designs, this is a very recent uh, um, development in uh, experimental design. Randomized control trials were considered the gold standard for experimental design. If you think about, uh, in, in the US, if you think about applying to, uh, for grants to the NIH or NSF, uh, they like gold st the gold standard, the randomized control trials, because that's what the, you can use for showing causality. You've compared two groups, pre and post, uh, an experimental and a control group, and if there is change in the group where you have uh, carried out an intervention, then you can show that there is some causality. So completely controlled. Um, however, what works for the group may not work for the individual. We're talking about group level data when we talk about randomized control trials. So I, I want to give an example from uh, nature. Um, this, the uh, graph that I'm about to show uh, went a little bit viral when it first came. So this is, um, these are the 10 most commonly consumed drugs in America. If you look at the data, uh, the blue man represents, man or woman represents the number of people the medicine helps. The pink one represents the number of people it fails to help. So if you look at this, these are all mostly products of randomized controlled trials. Um, one out of 25 people is what the second most commonly consumed drug helps. So you're actually better off not taking the drug because it's, it'll probably have a lot of side effects anyway. Um, one out of three is the least. So randomized control trials, why are they not working then? Well, in, medic in medicine, we know why they don't help because most of the people that are chosen to take these trials are um, healthy, most of the times healthy, white males aged between 18 and 40. So obviously, um, my composition is very different from a white male. Uh, between the age of 18 to 40. Um, therefore, the idea of, okay, uh, so that, that's one point. With the advance of geno uh, genomics, um, it is possible to have personalized medicine. So for example, if you have cancer, then each person who has cancer reacts very differently to the same treatment. So personalized or precision medicine has become a very important part of uh, medical research. In fact, the Obama administration last year had uh, allocated about $215 million <laughs> just for the precision medicine alternative. Coming into education, how is this helpful? Um, consider children who have autism, who are in the autism spectrum disorder. One child with problem behaviors, because he or she has autism, is going to be very different from another child who has autism. So they are going to exhibit very different types of problem behaviors. Um, they are going to uh, react very differently to different types of intervention. So then you need to have a personalized treatment or intervention. And then combining them across trials, across experiments, and across studies using meta-analysis becomes a big challenge. How do you do that? So the purpose of uh, single case research designs or single subject designs uh, is to document a functional relation between the independent variable and the dependent variable. 
What does this really mean? Well, um, this means that if I, my independent variable is whether I have undergone a treatment or I have not, which means I could be in a baseline phase, not undergoing a treatment, and then an intervention phase where I am undergoing a treatment. So is my, uh, um, is my dependent variable, let's say, problem behaviors, are my problem behaviors in the baseline phase greater than my problem behaviors in the intervention phase? If so, then there is indication that the intervention works. Um, of course, we are considering only one person here or one unit here. So obviously, we want to show causality. How do you show causality with just one person, right? Um, well, we want to use replication as a necessary tool for demonstrating experimental control. I will show you what this means. But one of the, um, one of the standards uh, that asks for intervention, an intervention effect that, show it, that shows strong evidence of causality is that that intervention must have been used in five or more studies published by three or more uh, in, uh, independent research groups containing 20 or more successful experiments. So we are talking about how the intervention works for individuals, but we are also going to combine it across studies, across individuals, across different trials. So not only do you want to demonstrate an effect, that an effect exists, but you want to also demonstrate that the effect exists at multiple points in time. All of this goes back to our basic idea of validity, right? How do we know we are measuring what we want to measure? And our, one of the main uh, facets of internal validity, which is causality. So let's say your problem behaviors are high during the baseline phase, and they are low during the intervention phase, right? So how do you know this is really because you implemented an intervention? Maybe you just became very tired of exhibiting problem behaviors and then stopped doing that. And I happen to call it the intervention phase, right? So can you then demonstrate this effect at multiple points in time? Replication, it comes to, uh, it begs to the point of replication. Or if you don't, in certain designs, let's say you've already lowered your blood cholesterol level, right? Then Maybe it's, not, maybe it's not possible to go back to the baseline phase, then how can you do this replication? Um, well, you can do that using uh, different types of experimental designs within single case designs, which is what we will see today as well. So not only do you want to show effect at one single point in time, you want to show it at multiple points in time so you have replication that you can show within the study itself. So. And um, the, other, um, the other facet that sh uh, focuses on demonstrating a functional relation is uh, demonstrating the change in the dependent variable occurring only when the independent variable is manipulated, right? So if something, if there is a confounding variable that has impacted your, in your, your dependent variable, obviously that is a threat to validity. So in essence, let's just compare our usual group designs with the single case designs. Group designs, their validity depends on whether you have a representative sample, but I mean a randomized control sample, right? Usually a, a randomized sample. A single case design, you have a purposive selection of participants. I mean, you, if you're having a cancer trial, you actually go out and select people who have cancer. You don't do a randomized selection in that case. Um, in group designs, you have an experimental and a control group. In a single case design, the person's own behavior, the baseline behavior forms his or her own control. Um, in group designs, you're going to verify intervention effects in the pre and the post phase. Uh, in single subject designs, you're going to verify intervention effects by replication and some other uh, aspects as well, which we will discuss. Group designs are only usually focused on average scores of the groups, and then there is a between variances, uh, uh, variances between the groups, variances within the groups. But in single case, you're going to look at individualized scores. How, how are my scores changing across time? And group, di group designs, we usually do statistical analysis in single case. You can do statistical analysis, otherwise I would be out of a job, uh, but you can also do visual analyses.
I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time because this is very general and anyone who has taken a research course will know, will know this and can put it together when we finish um, this talk. So what happens in a single case design? You have a baseline phase and you have an intervention phase. So a baseline phase is simply the condition before an intervention is implemented, a condition where no in intervention is implemented as well. So you want to study the pattern of observations before the intervention. So let's say a child comes in and exhibits problem behaviors, right? If the child has autism. Then um, there will be problem behaviors today. There will be problem behaviors to tomorrow as well. Maybe there will be less problem behaviors the day after. And maybe it will fluctuate. And maybe it will fluctuate a lot depending on whether he or she has had a good day or a bad day. Uh, it might depend on several things. Uh, maybe it'll fluctuate very little. So we want to look at how much is the fluctuation across time that is happening in the baseline phase so that we have an understanding of the pattern, of the general pattern that happens before an intervention is implemented. Once there is some amount of stability in the baseline phase, an intervention or a treatment is implemented. Um, so I think in, in your slides, it says IV. I, uh, single case design researchers use the word, use the term IV for representing intervention. I find it very confusing because I think I'm simple minded, because IV to me represents independent variables. So if it is there, you can, you can just put a cross against it if you are as obsessive as I am. But uh, you shouldn't, in order to not have any uh, confusion, I'm not going to refer to intervention as IV. Um, so you actually implement an intervention, and then you look at the behavioral pattern or your dependent variable, which will suggest if there is effectiveness of the treatment or not. And also, you want to make sure that there is complete experimental control. So in experimental designs, what, what we are really hoping for is to demonstrate some amount of replication right? in, in, in a single case design. So we we, you could use what we call as a reversal design, which is an ABAB design. So you have a baseline, and then you have an intervention phase. So let's say now I can hypothesize that, OK, my problem behaviors went down because I went through this intervention. You can say, well, is it going to repeat? Is it, are you going to do the same thing if I were to give you this intervention again? I don't know. So I'm going to remove that intervention and let the child go back to the baseline phase and see if the, if the, if the behavior will reverse itself back to the original range of values, and then implement the intervention again and see if the uh, problem behaviors are going to go down. And if it does, then I mean, we call this an ABAB sort of design. Um, you can show that there is replication. If you remove the intervention, there is reversal to the, to the baseline uh, behaviors. And then when you put the intervention back in, the, ba the problem behaviors are reduced again. So within the same subject, right? So we're talking about replication, but within the same experiment, within the same subject, you're going to do it multiple times in order to show replication. The other design, and another design is called multiple baseline design. A multiple baseline design is where, so let's, let's assume if I were really skeptical, right? I might say, um, you, inter you um, let's say somebody um, uh, had an intervention that was inserted at time point 10. I could say, well, after 10 time points, this person is going to always, maybe always, always come back to a normal behavior, have reduced problem behavior. So I'm not very happy with that. Or maybe you can't really reverse some things, like I was talking before. So then we stagger when the intervention is implemented across a couple of participants. So that's a, a single case design that doesn't necessarily mean only one person. You can have multiple people, but you are interested in patterns within a single person. So the unit of analysis is a single person, but you could have multiple people in the study. So you stagger it. So let's say Bob, um, his problem behaviors are measured for 10 time points 
And then at the 10th time point, there's an intervention. And then there is uh, his problem behaviors are measured during the intervention phase. Then there is Sam, and I'm going to observe Sam for a little bit longer, maybe until 15 time points, and then implement an intervention and see what happens. And then and maybe there's Mary, and I'm going to observe her for 20 time points, and then implement an intervention and see how her behaviors are changing. So you stagger it and see if there is replication, again, across different time points now, right? Across time point 10, 15, and 20 for those respective participants. So that is a multiple baseline design. And technically, people ask for at least four such cases in a multiple baseline design to show strong evidence. Uh, notice one thing here. An AB design is not going to show a have a lot of validity, right? I mean, there are so many threats to it. You can say, well, this could happen because of anything. How do you know this happened really because of the intervention? When you have an ABAB design, it's a little bit difficult to argue when the data really shows in the A phase, you have a lot of problem behaviors, B phase, very few problem behaviors, A phase, again, a lot of problem behaviors, B phase, again, very few problem behaviors. So, there's, so it's, it's, it, it, becomes, it, it becomes more a tighter design, more waterproof here. So what has happened is you have shown three demonstrations of effect from A to B, B to A, and A to B again. And in multiple baseline, when you have four people, you have shown that the intervention has affected at four different time points, right? So they, and they are staggered. And there are other designs called alternating treatments design. So let's say um, in your baseline, after your baseline phase, your, in, your first intervention was uh, to make sure that the child was able to at least reduce some kind of problem behavior. Let's say, let's say it was um, um, hitting, right? And then you can, you can change the criteria and say, well, now that your hitting has gone down, I'm going to change this criteria and say, you need to stop screaming as well as stop hitting, right? So you can, you can keep changing the criteria um, and then see how each of those uh, behaviors are changing during the different phases. You can give alternating treatments as well. Let's say um, first time you're going to give a, a, one type of intervention, and then the second time you're going to give another type of intervention, and so on. So that's also possible. So these are all different designs, the ABAB, the multiple baseline, alternating treatments, multi-component designs, like the changing criteria one. Um, they're all different experimental designs. But what, why do we need all of these? We need all of these because the WhatWorks Clearing House, which has basically come up with uh, a couple of single case uh, scholars, have come up with standards which require three demonstrations of effect for high quality research design. So that is, that is the reason why we need at least four people for multiple baseline. You need an ABAB design if you're not doing a multiple baseline, and so on. So that's, that's the most important. If you're going to take home one thing with you, then from, from this lecture, then it should be three demonstrations of effect. So what do we mean by that, right? Um, let's see why that is important. Um, in your single case design, you have repeated measures of the dependent variable. That is, um, in a 24-hour period, you want to look at uh, how many uh, 15 minute intervals there are with, uh, with disturbed sleep for an individual. Um, and then you plot each of these for a baseline. So, they, so, so in the baseline, you get some idea as to where this person is in terms of, in terms of disturbed sleep. And then um, you have some sort of an intervention that you're implementing so, uh, to see if, if the number of intervals are reducing because you, you, want, to have, you want to have more sleep. Everybody wants more sleep, right? Uh, so you implement an intervention and see if it goes down. So that's, that's your, that's your, this is your A phase, your B phase. And then you remove it to see, well, if I don't have this intervention, are you going to have bad sleep? Yes. So, and then you put the intervention back in to see if there is, uh, if there is a replication effect that you can demonstrate. So that's a typical example of how data is plotted in, in, in an ABAB design. 
So the next thing is we, are, we do a within subject comparison, right? We are not comparing how Bob is doing versus how Mary is doing. That's not what we are concerned about. We are only concerned about how Bob is doing. We are only concerned about whether Bob's problem behaviors have been reduced. So that's all, that's all we, are, we are concerned about. So it is a, you concentrate on within subject uh, measures. That is, this is just for one person. What is the fluctuation that's happening? What is the pattern that is happening? Whether that pattern and the general trend has reduced where you expect it to reduce, right? Those are the things that we are concerned about. Replication of effect. You want to have replication of effect. We talked about this earlier. So when I take away, when I put in the intervention, is my, uh, is my dependent variable decreasing? When I remove it, is it increasing? And then when I put it back in, is it decreasing again? And then there's flexibility that you can have in uh, single case designs as well. Uh, let's say you are giving some sort of uh, an intervention, and it's not really working, right? Um, so this child is not really I I responding to uh, ma manding is a, is, a, is a technique that's used in autism research uh, to uh, increase child responses to certain um, certain requests. So the child is not responding very well in the beginning, even during the intervention. He or she is not. So you remove the intervention, let the child go back to his or her baseline, and then implement another sort of intervention to see if that works. So there is a lot of flexibility that you have in single case designs. Oh, that's. Usually we do visual analysis. This is very common um, in single case uh, data. So visually you can see what the, um, what the data looks like. So that's an advantage as well. Um, in order to have it more objective, we look at, so these are the three demonstrations that we talked about. We look at changes in the level between the different faces. So the average is re represented by the blue arrows. Um, and then you can look at how much they are close to each other or how different they are from each other. Uh, so that's the change in the level or intercept, if you want to think about it statistically. We can look at changes in trend or slopes. So let's say I have a line of best fit that I'm drawing. We can look at how, how different the slopes are. And you can see in the first case, it's positive, and then it's, it's kind of negative. It's positive, and then negative. And they're not really overlapping with each other. You could, uh, this is just some uh, reference that you can uh, go back to. You could look at changes in variability. So what does that mean? Let's say I have a line of best fit, and then I can extend it and see if I were to just allow this child to continue where he or she would be, and then um, just draw some standard error bars and look at variability, uh, that's very different from what's happening in the intervention phase here, right? So I can continue the same thing with the second baseline and the second intervention phases in order to show that there is, there is a, a very clear pattern that exists within each phase, and the patterns are different across the phases. The other uh, thing that you can look at is overlap. So this is the range, these are the range of scores that I have in the baseline phase that's represented by the red dots here. This is the range of scores for uh, the intervention, um, intervention phases. We can look at how much they overlap. There is some amount of overlap, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it's not perfect, but um, yeah, I mean, based on this, you can make a uh, conclusion as to whether there was a good effect or uh, there wasn't. This is an example of multiple baseline that we were talking about earlier. So you have three uh, here. Usually, we need to have four. So you have three different, uh, inter I mean, uh, three different participants for whom interventions are implemented at different time points, as you can see from the staggering. That's the first demonstration of effect so because, uh, because your baseline data is over here in the bottom, and the intervention data is a little bit higher up. And then there are, this is the second demonstration and the third demonstration. These are not great effects. This is taken from real data, actually. Um, and then again, you can compare the levels. 
and look at how, how your um, data are looking across the dif uh, different faces for the different participants. So we come to my favorite part, visual versus statistical analysis of single case data. Obviously, if you're a statistician and if you look at this data, then you're thinking, well, I can't do a t-test on this. I mean, I can't do, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I have very less data. I'm not going to get statistical significance, right? And you're right. You will not get statistical significance most of the time. In fact, you shouldn't worry about it because statistical significance is evil. Uh, so visual analysis, right? It, you, what are you looking to, for? You're looking to determine the functional relationship between your independent and your dependent variable. That is your different faces and your dependent variable. The data in single case design, this is, the, this is where the problem comes in, is autocorrelated. It's just a fancy term for saying my, pro, my behavior at time point one will affect my behavior at time point two, which will affect my behavior at time point three, and so on. This is a problem in visual and statistical analysis because this makes the lines look jagged a lot in visual analysis. This violates most of the assumptions in statistics because you have independence of observations assumption in statistic, right? So it, makes, it means you can't do a t-test, you can't do an ANOVA, you can't do regression, any of the stuff that you can think of the top of your head, you can't do most of them um, statistically. So that means you also have um, higher probability of type 2 errors. This, this also means you have high probability of type 1 errors in visual analysis. Uh, and then visual analysis can be less objective. Uh, there are, I mean, although there are some set rules. In um, statistically, well, we were talking about it. It is more objective, but the small sample size makes it very difficult in addition to the autocorrelation. Um, what do you, how, how do you even measure uh, an effect in this is a problem. So I just talked about serial dependency, dependency, so I'm just going to skip this slide. It simply means that how I behave at, how, how I behave at time point 9 will influence how I behave at time point 10 and so on. And that's why this data looks so much more jagged than a regular longitudinal data that you will find. Statistics, uh, statistically, what we tend to do is uh, look at effect sizes, uh, which is an important metric. We can look at what is the difference in the observations between the baseline phase and an intervention phase. It can be something as simple as that, which is your Cohen's D, a standardized effect size. Um, it helps estimate the potential benefit of intervention to the target population. So if you have multiple independent variables, interventions, you can look at which is the most effective component. But the problem, the problem in uh, computing these effect sizes is that there's autocorrelation, right? So that means you're going to misestimate the amount of effect size. So there, is, there are lots of studies that have been done in the recent years by Larry Hedges and some of his colleagues that take into account some sort of correction factors for effect size, for uh, computing effect sizes with autocorrelations. So that's, that's a good place to start if you want to, if you want to really work on effect sizes in um, single case designs. This is just a summary of some statistical methods and procedures that are available for single case data. Um, I will just end up reading, up reading out the stuff which you can do later on at your own time. Um, to summarize, the problems with statistical analysis is you have less data, typically four to six data points per face. Right? It doesn't even make sense to compute standard deviation for this, actually. Uh, you have large standard errors because of that, because there is more inaccuracy in your estimates. Um, autocorrelation, which means you have violation of assumptions. And if you have autocorrelation, you can't use simple ordinary least squares kind of methods. You have to use maximum likelihood, but Maximum likelihood will only work when you have very large sample sizes. So this is a, this is a cyclical problem. Um, the effect sizes are a problem as well, because even if, you, even if you use Cohen's D sort of effect size, you can't meta-analyze it, because the within group variance that you're going to divide by is going to be different. In, in other words, you're going to compare 20 kilos and 100 pounds without converting the weights into the same metrics. You're going to, the same metric. You're going to say 100 is larger than 20. Uh, in this case, 100 pounds is larger than 20 kilos, but um, 
it, it wouldn't work all the time, right? If it's 100, if it's 20 and 30, for example. And then distributional concerns. In single case data, we often use count data or proportion data, which means you have to do non-parametric analysis that only makes the headache worse. Um, so this is a simple example. Uh, this is fake, da fake data, generated data for a multiple baseline design. Let's look at it, right? Uh, you have baseline and intervention. First participant, it looks like the intervention, well, maybe, maybe it worked a little bit. Second participant, they're both in about the same range. Third participant, maybe it worked a teeny bit. Um, fourth, not so much either. If I simply computed coins D type of effect size and an average effect size, this is what I have, 2.72. Even for people that we thought the intervention did not work, which was participants two and four, there is a large effect size. I mean, one, <laughs> 1 1.09 and 1.6, if you got this in your randomized control trial, that's amazing, right? Um, but it's not, because in single case designs, your your within group standard deviation, right? I mean, this and the fa and your auto autocorrelation really, really hinders with your com with your effect size, and that makes that makes interpretation very difficult. So, Natasen, which is me, came up with another approach, a confirmatory approach, to look at how to confirm immediacy of effect. Um, I used a Bayesian uh, model, which means you don't have to worry about single, uh, small sample data. It also can handle autocorrelations. It can handle any type of data distribution. So, that, so there are lots of advantages to using Bayesian uh, statistics in single case designs. So the, what I wanted to do was, you don't know if there is immediacy of effect in, in, in general in single case data. That is, you don't know if an, if an intervention had an effect immediately after you implemented it, which is a requirement for single case designs to have strong evidence of causality. So how do you know that? Usually visual analysts kind of look at the data and, and plot it and say, well, yeah, I mean, the last three time points in the baseline look different from the first three time points in the intervention. Therefore, there is immediacy. So instead, the approach that I've proposed looks at all of the data, looks at the pattern of all the data points and sees I, I don't know where a change took place, actually. I'm going to, I actually know it, but I'm going to tell the algorithm, pretend you don't know where the change took place. And now tell me where the change took place. And if it tells me that the change took place at time point 10, every one of the 200,000 times I ask it, which is what you do in the Bayesian approach, then you have confirmation that there is immediacy of your intervention. So that's basically the idea between, behind the Bayesian unknown change point models. If you're burning to know about this, I'm giving a talk on this on Monday at the QuantHub seminar series. So this is, this is an example, a sample of a result from a multiple baseline study. So in this case, this change point is um, what I want to estimate. Um, you can see that if, if I didn't tell you, if I didn't have this broken line here, then most people would say these three points belong to one face and the rest of these belong to one face because that's, that's what it looks like. It looks like these three are in the same region. This, is, this looks pretty close to the fourth time point, looks pretty close to the fifth time point, and they, all, all of these look like they are in one single region. And that's exactly what the algorithm tells us. The algorithm tells us, well, I don't know if the change took place at time point three or four. They both look like pretty good candidates. And every... This is, the, this is the proportion of um, the, this density that you see is the proportion of times four was chosen as the change point and three was chosen as, as the change point from 400,000 repeti repetitions of the, um, of the procedure. Similarly, case three, is, case three is a problem, right? Because there is no variation. This might look great to a visual analyst. This might look great to a, 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 a normal person. But to us abnormal statisticians, this looks bad because we want variation. If everybody behaved identically, right, we'd be out of jobs. So that is why this is having a problem in the estimation. Similarly, K7. K7 is all over the place, all over the place. And you can see that, um, yeah, it is all over the place. And that's exactly what my algorithm is telling me. And um, this particular case, even though this pattern is not that clear, 
the algorithm was able to point out that seven was the time point that the uh, intervention was implemented. So um, it doesn't work all the time, the algorithm, but it works most of the time. And that's at least there is one inferential method, a probabilistic method that can help show immediacy in single case designs, which, which did not exist before. So that's, that's the unique contribution of this project. So bottom line judgment criteria for decision making, we want to look at uh, the research question and uh, understand the context of the study and the pattern of the visual data. We want to use statistical analysis to enhance and not substitute visual analysis because they both form different parts of the coin and, and they both are required in order for us to understand the data. Uh, not all statistical methods are equal. Bayesian is far better than anything you can think of. Um, simplest model explains uh, the best. So you want to always stick to the law of parsimony. Because when you look at the data, some of the data that I showed, right, you could have, you could have, you could have line of best fit with slope or a, or a curve of best fit with a quadratic or a cubic or a quartic curve. But you, you, at that point, you're simply data mining. I mean, you could find a curve that passes through every single point, but um, you're, you're simply mining for data if you're trying to do that. So try to um, fit the, the best possible, the simplest possible uh, model to the data. So the things that you want to make sure are um, for showing strong evidence of causality are immediacy. That is, the minute you implement your, your intervention, uh, your intervention takes a, uh, an effect on your uh, dependent variable. You want to show that there is less overlap of data across the faces. You want to show that the trend, if, you're, if you are fitting lines with slopes, you want to show that the slopes are very different. You want to show that the intercepts or the mean levels are very different uh, across the faces as well. So this is some of the recent advances in effect sizes that I was talking about. And uh, you could also look at the percentage of non-overlapping data um, in addition to that. I think that is all I have.